This is African Pod Business Forum. And my guest for a thoughtful business conversation is Nina Jotland. Nina is originally from Denmark. She found her way to Africa for an adventure many years ago and fell in love with the continent in Tanzania. Nina Jotland now calls Australia home, from where she continues to help the disadvantaged through a non-profit organization called Australia for Sida Tanzania. And she does all these using business principles and skills, as well as unlimited passion. And now, the thoughtful conversation with Nina. I was born in Denmark originally, and I lived there the first 30 years of my life, very normal and in a suburb, and I needed something more from life. So I, at that time, I was married with a man from Sudan, or he grew up in Egypt, so we decided to move to first to Egypt, so we stayed there for a while, um, and I was studying Arabic and Middle Eastern studies. Um, after we stayed in Egypt for a while, we then went on a holiday to Tanzania, uh, and that holiday turned out to be 13 years for, my, <laughs> for me, at least, yeah, so, so that was quite interesting. And you almost became an African at heart. I did. I still have Africa in my heart. So, so after living 13 years in Tanzania, um, I've, I've been immersed in, in, in the local community. I you know, was part of the community. It, it was really important to me. And after living there for 13 years, um, I met my Australian partner in Tanzania. So we now decided to move here to Australia, here to Perth. Through your travels, what did you learn that has turned you into a businesswoman at heart? I think the most important thing that you learn when you travel is that things can be done differently. Things are not automatically done the way that you do it at home. You learn that, that maybe there are different solutions to the same problem, that there is not necessarily right and wrong, but there can be many different ways of, of looking at a certain problem. And I think that's a really interesting skill to have um, also through my time <clears throat> abroad where I have um, been in different kinds of businesses you, you learn um, to listen to people you learn to um, doing business in places where where things don't always go as planned or, or where you you meet obscure obstructions on your way so you get to be a problem solver no matter what kind of business you're in so for me the business skills that I have learned and achieved um, it is not necessarily in one set of business, but it can be applied to all sorts of different kinds of businesses because it's a problem solving skills, it's a people skill, it's a um, knowing of different cultures and accepting uh, cultural beliefs and, and different ways of, of problem solving. And when you were living in Tanzania, you certainly identified, as it were, some problems that needed solving and you've created an organization that solves some of those problems. Tell me about it. Yeah, definitely. So we all know that Tanzania is uh, is a developing country. Uh, there's a lot of things that, that it's not easy accessible. Like, like there's not always uh, power. There's not always water. When I first moved to, to Tanzania in 2005, in fact, there's been a shortage of rainfall and uh, Tanzania relies very much on hydropower. So for the first few years I was there, there was restriction of, on the power use. So first, we didn't have any power, say, two days a week. Then it was three days a week. And in the end, we only had power on Fridays and Sundays, the two religious days. And in the end, they even cut the Friday away. So we only had power every Sunday. And when there's no power, we also have no water because the pumps that runs, the water pumps run on power. So we had no water either. So the whole city had no electricity. We were all running around with our pots and pans trying to collect water on Sundays. We had to buy some drinking water from the brewery, not even beer. We were dry, <laughs> buying water from the brewery, <laughs> a whole other business. Um, but yeah, so, so you learn to problem solve in so many other different ways. And it makes me wonder though, in, at those times, didn't you think of Denmark, how, <laughs> how you know, much better life was over there? Sure, it, it, it puts your own life in perspective. Growing up in a Western country, um, it puts your own life in perspective in the sense of like, you, don't, you, you realize how you take things for granted. 
I took for granted I could turn my tap on and drink a glass of water. I took for granted I could have a shower every day. I took for granted that I could go to the shop and buy things that I was in need of. It's a whole different life when you live in a third world country where, first of all, you can't just go and buy these things that you think you really, really need. You can't just turn the tap on and expect water to come out. A lot of houses has no running water. Um, the majority has no running water or has any toilets or any any other ways of, of getting like electricity. Um, even though, for example, Tanzania everywhere seems to be on the grid, it can be really hard for the local village to connect to the grid because they have to themselves to set up a pole, they have to connect from this pole into the main road, which will cost the equivalent of, say, one or two years' salary. So nobody connects to the grid. So they live without electricity and they live without running water, which is one of the problems we see in the Amatongo ward where, where we, we conduct a lot of our product, uh, projects. So how did you cope personally seeing that that was completely different from your own upbringing? Um, I think I I in the beginning it, it was... For me an adventure things were different and you see it as an adventure then you realize this is not an adventure for people who live there this is their everyday life this is how they live every single day then it becomes not an adventure anymore then it becomes that's a way of life and you realize how blessed we are living in a western world where we can access these things freely we can access medical care we can access you know, get a doctor when we need to. We can get medicine from a doctor when we need to. That is also something that is not always there. Even though you go to a hospital, oh, sorry, we've run out of malaria medication. It's not available. So sorry. That wouldn't happen here. Um, so so all of these things, it, it, it taught me so much to put my own life in perspective, to not take all these things for granted and, and realizing that that it's not just fun and an adventure for those people who live like that. And that changed my way um, of, of wanting to give back and wanting to work for these people and try to, to provide a better life for them. What did that make you, what did that lead you to do then? What was the action or series of um, actions that you took or steps that you took? So uh, I met um, a man in, in um, Tanzania. He was from Ireland or he is from Ireland. And um, he was working on this project. He really, really wanted to build a hospital in Tanzania. So we started working together um, in an organization called CEDA Tanzania. Um, and we said we would build, or we would work in one area um, because we had to define what we were doing in some sort of way or form. So we, we um, did a baseline survey in, in one ward where it's about 30,000 people living in this ward where they basically had no power, no water, no medical facilities and very few access roads, um, which meant, for example, a pregnant lady would have to sit on the back of a motorbike on a dusty road for about two hours to get to the nearest hospital to give birth, which meant a lot of women couldn't afford that because it would cost money to get this, this uh, motorcycle taxi. Um, they would give birth at home, uh, which would result in, in a lot of uh, mo mothers die in childbirth, and then there would be a lot of orphans. Uh, we also saw a lot of children dying from malaria, from typhoid, um, from dirty water. Um, so, so there was a lot of problems in this area, and we went out and asked the people, what are your concerns? What would change your life if, if we put it down to what, what, would, what is the one thing that we can do for you that would make your life a lot better. So the consensus in the society there was they would like to, to have some medical facility so they could get proper treatment. So that's what we did. We built a hospital. You make it sound simple. <laughs> uh, it was no, no way simple. <laughs> Nothing ever is. It sounds so easy, but you know, of course, the idea was easy. Yep, let's do that. And How hard can it be? For, uh, and it is a not for profit. Yes. But you do need business principles to, to start it, sure. to run it. Sure. I believe a non-for-profit, even though, you know, it's a charity, it, it's, you know, we, we are doing it to help other people, but it's also a business. Of course, a business has to run. And we are 
you know, want to sell a product, you have to treat a non-for-profit as a business entity, because otherwise it can't run. We have to adhere to the same rules and regulations. We have to adhere to, to the same laws. We have to have our finances audited. You know, in that sense, we are a business just like everybody else. The difference is just we don't have shareholders who get, you know, a share of all the profit. All the profit goes into building or to creating good stuff for the people in the Matunga ward. So tell me about the success you, you've chalked so far. So what we have done is that we have built the hospital so far. So we, we acquired the land, um, we, uh, um, we built and constructed the hospital. So, you know, out of no- nothing, we had to build a water pump station to pump the water from the lake and treat the water so we can get clean water into the hospital. Uh, we have just gotten actually solar power installed to our hospital so we can now have continuous electricity in our hospital which is quite important when people come in and giving birth at night or you know having to have stitches or so forth so we have 16 beds we treat about 1200 patients a month we have about 2000 children every month in our vaccination clinic and we average about two births a day apart from that we said it's not everybody who can access our hospital it's because um, the the area is wide and far. So it's, you know, people with disabilities, they find it really hard to come into our hospital. So we created an outreach service. So we have trained two medical officers, two females in riding motorbikes because the roads are not accessible. They're not tarmac roads like here. They're all dirt roads and not really roads, really. There are lots of rocks and sandy bits and you have to verge in and out on. And then, so they go out and they speak to people out in the little villages. They speak to them about what is a disability because sometimes people don't even know what a disability is. There's a lot of stigma surrounding disability. So people would sometimes think that, oh, it's an evil curse or maybe I did something bad in my life so now my baby is is disabled in some way. It it will be shameful. So we try to speak to them about um, what is a disability, how it can be treated. Maybe these children can be better, or it can be an old man who's going blind. It can be um, various dif- different physical uh, disabilities or mental disabilities. So a lot of education. It's a lot of education and a lot of training um, because we also, for example, we see a lot of spina bifida and we see a lot of cerebral palsy. And we go out and we uh, speak to the families and we do some basic training with them so they can do some occupational therapy at home. So maybe this child then can start sitting up, start participating in mealtime, maybe go to church with the family, you know, and slowly we can change the perception of what is a disability and, and the rights of people with disabilities and how they can participate in normal life. So, so that's one of our very successful projects as well. We have also started other projects um, like Tackle Africa, uh, which is our soccer program, where we um, also teach uh, young people between 13 to 18. We teach them about HIV and AIDS, reproductional health, um, sexual health in general, um, through uh, the game of soccer. So it's some very special um, developed soccer drills that teaches them um, about, that, that sort of exemplifies the way that one should treat each other, the respect between men and women. It, re- it teaches them um, about having a voice versus not having a voice. And in between, we also encourage them to have voluntary HIV testing to know their status. It goes without saying, or rather asking, how do you fund all these? It's a lot of government funding. We access a lot of um, foreign aid grants. Uh, we've just been shortlisted to UK aid, which we will get an answer for in two weeks. So that's very exciting because that's a, a, a big grant. Um, it's a, so it's various different um, foreign aid money. We also access what is called the basket fund money, which is um, you know a lot of the foreign aid money that gets into a basket and gets divided out. Uh, We also do a lot of crowdfunding, so it's also from person to person, um, you know, um, and we we have some CSR programs with some large global companies as well. So in that sense, we have been very fortunate to receive a lot of support, both politically and and from uh, the 
business world as well as well as from from the man on the street and on your website you have a, a place where you have uh, what's called the hall uh, hall of fame where yes we you do actually mention uh, the company and individuals that have helped you yes we do we do because people need recognition uh, and we are so immensely thankful for every person who donates and helps us in any sort of way so the least we can do is to mention them on our website um, we also try to, to, you know, we send out personal emails to each and every individual who helps us out because I think it's important to have that personal um, touch with everybody who, who shows us interest because their kindness makes us able to, to change the world. I can remember each and every individual um, when they contacted me, when I had a conversation with, them, with me, because I believe when people give to charities, it's important to have a personal face to it. Even for me, for myself, if I want to give to a charity, it's important that I feel um, connected to this charity or to this non-profit. And that's really what I try to do, um, to reach out, to, to become a person that they know. They can ask me questions about where the money is going, how's it going with this project, and I'm happy always to answer it. So, so I, we are not this big organization like, you know, you, you have some big global organizations. And you don't want to mention any names. No, exactly. I don't want to mention any <laughs> names. <my> exactly. <laughs> um, but, but they don't have that personal face to them um, where, where you just feel you, you put your money in and maybe they disappear somewhere and they're probably going to go to some, something good. I'm not disputing that, but you don't have that personal feel. Here we're such a small team. Everybody knows everyone. And... And we are relying on everybody who is our friend to spreading the word and then speaking to this person, speaking to the next person. And therefore, we have that personal contact to each and every donor, to each and every um, company. Um, and it's a very personal thing every time that they sponsor us. And it's a question on the minds of many about certain charities and how a large percentage of uh, mm -hmm. donations go of into course. administration and, and I wonder how you address um, mm -hmm. such Of course, a it's a question, you know, a lot of people, they think, you know, it's like, oh my God, we're not going to do any charity because we always hear that a lot of money gets disappeared and very little goes to where we go. We're very proud to say that we our overheads across our organization, both here in Australia and in Tanzania, are no more than 10 to 15%. Um, across all our projects and for us it's very uh, important that we are transparent with our finances um, and for example when we access uh, foreign aid money for example with UK aid we have to be part of what is called IATI which is International Aid Transparency but uh, all our finances are being laid out there so we are scrutinized and, and we're being looked through you know from every angle and we have nothing to hide and getting access to these uh, grants we can also have no more than between 10 to 15 percent overhead that, that's that's rather impressive isn't it because in many cases it is uh, the very opposite where uh, 80 90 percent goes into administration or yes <laughs> yes exactly and for us i mean it's possible to do this because we are a small organization so you know I, i'm the only person here in australia i'm the only person working um for Australia for CETA Tanzania. Um, we have the people on the ground. Uh, we have a team of about 12 people who are working in the office in Tanzania. Plus we have our staff from the, for the hospital itself. Um, so we, we don't have a very large team, uh, but we managed to, to create a lot of projects because we, we collaborate with a lot of other organizations who has the expertise. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to have the expertise on, on everything, like for example, to, to drill a borehole for clean water. None of us has the expertise for that, but we rely on collaborating with other people who has that expertise. I'm just looking at it from your background, uh, the fact mm. that you went to Africa, Tanzania specifically, not in order to form the organization you now run, as it were. No, that's true. <laughs> you went for an adventure, yep. and somehow you developed or you, you saw some problems that I needed solving. How do you sustain the passion to keep this going? Oh, I, I think I'm a very passionate person, and, and because I can see there's nobody else doing it. So, so if, if, I, if I didn't do it, there'd be nobody doing this. 
these people would then be left with nothing. And, and because it's all about the personal stories. I know Nyasa, who's 10, who just took his first steps because we were there. Otherwise, he would never have learned to walk. Um, there's Keflin, this lady who, who is very crafty and she's full of joy and life. And she, we have been able to get her three-wheel um, wheelchair so she can get around in, in, in town. We have also been able to give her a mobile toilet so she, because she's not able to walk. So she crawls on all fours to a latrine, which is not very hygienic. So for me, it gets to be all these personal stories for these people who, who are important to me. Well, it's easy to see, but because as you speak, <laughs> it does come across from your heart. Yes, very much so. Uh, I, I really, you know, Tanzania has a, a part of my heart. That, that, that there's no question about it. Uh, and it, it's important to my whole family. My children grew up in Tanzania. They're now six and eight. And they consider themselves Tanzanian because that's where they grew up. So it has a big place in our heart. And we are really delighted that we are able to go back to Tanzania and go back and see the projects, meet the people and, and enjoy just having a meal with them and having, having you know, the smiles uh, and see the difference in their lives. That, that makes it worth it for me every single time to see those smiles, to see the difference every year. So what are the challenges you do face though? The challenges we do face, um, of course, it's always funding. Funding is, we could do a million things if we had, you know, all the money in the world. But, you know, that, <laughs> that is not so. So funding is always a big thing and we always on the hunt for more money. We also, like, one of the things that we are facing at the moment is we want to provide clean water because there's no clean water supply to the area. So at the moment, most of the people, they go down to the lake and get a bucket of water, which, of course, there's a lot of waterborne diseases, there's parasites, there's, you know, um, lots of different things in the water that one shouldn't drink. Um, often the people, they have no other choice but to use this water because there is nothing else. Um, so we are at the moment, we are trying to raise funds to create a borehole, so have clean water with a solar powered well, um, so they can have sustainable water for the future. Because that will also mean that less deaths, uh, because gastroenteritis is one of the biggest killers of the under fives that we have in the area, which is caused by waterborne diseases. Um, we also see a lot of uh, parasites, uh, diseases, so it, it would solve a lot of other problems that we see, like young, young girls spending the whole day collecting water and therefore not spending all their time at school, for example. Very yes. understandable. So uh, how do you envision the future from here on for your organization? So what, what we are working, we're working very closely with the local district council. Um, so our hospital is running in a partnership with, with the authorities uh, in the sense that they have to provide the doctors and the, the medical supply. So our vision is we have an MOU with, with the local district council to take over the hospital after 10 years. So we have a sustainability plan in place to, to hand it over, to train some people, or train the people within Tanzania. So it's constant, the training and, and the upskilling of our Tanzanian um, employees. Um, and in, in the event of in 10 years uh, to hand over the hospital, so our organ organization hands this over to be on the hand fully in, uh, in the district council. So because we, we are keeping the hospital as a public hospital, so we keep the cost down. So because nobody in the area would be able to afford a private hospital, so that was never the vision to have a private hospital in the area. Once we, we have done this, so, so this is the first hospital we're building, we would love to copy this and then start an, another place and copy it again. And then, you know, that it would, would spread like rings in the water. You know, it's interesting to just hear you say our employees uh, yeah. because it's a not, not for profit business, but it's still a business. Of course it is. Of course it is. What qualities do you need to run it successfully? Um, I think passion is great. Passion is really important, like because passion comes from the heart. Skills and numbers and things like that, that can be taught, that can, you can learn that, but you can't learn passion. I, I think that's, that's really the most important thing. You have to find your passion, what you want to do in life. 
for me, the rest can be taught or learned, whatever. Yet I do accounting, I've set up websites, I have done all sorts of different things that I thought I would never do in my life. Um, but because I have the passion to do this, then I teach myself or find somebody who knows how to do it. Oh, can you please, you know, get me some, some ins and outs and this and where do I start? You know, because, because if you don't have the passion, you would not have the drive to want to learn these things. So I think first and foremost, if you want to run any kind of business, you have to have the passion for it. And the passion is probably what got you traveling in the first place. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I think so. The passion to see the world, to see that, that there was a world outside of my own little bubble, to, to see that there is people living differently, to, to put my own life in perspective. And that passion got you to try to learn Arabic. That's true. That's true. So, so that was my main field of study was Arabic and Middle Eastern studies. Not that I've used that a whole lot in the sense of speaking Arabic, but I think having a university study has gives you some skills of research, of, of putting up a thesis, uh, you know, and, and trying to, to solve this thesis of, of figuring out um, what is behind it. So, so you learn those skills and those skills you can transfer into all sorts of different fields. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you, Nina. And that was a thoughtful conversation with Nina Jotland, the founder of Australia for Sina Tanzania. She uses business principles to run a non-profit organization to help people. My name is Philip Nyako and African Port Business Forum is produced by African Port in Perth. You can listen to African Port Business Forum on podcast anytime by subscribing for free. The video version of these thoughtful conversations are also available on YouTube. Just search for African Port Business Forum.